I call my paper the age of amnesia. The elections are over and a man has been installed as the Prime Minister of our country who represents a mindset that I ideologically oppose and find deeply disturbing. Nevertheless, despite my personal assessment, he was democratically elected by the people of our country and has swept into power with such a force that any semblance of a credible opposition has completely vanished. The people who did not vote for him are in shell shock. Political parties that opposed him in an absolute disarray. Other political parties of the side on the fence, hoping to negotiate a future and things went another way, are now genuflecting before him in, a, in obeisance. In a strange way, our democracy has elected an emperor. And yet, why am I not surprised? To understand what I'm getting at, I have to go a little further back in our history. We have to go back to the time when India became a republic with a written constitution. It was a time when our leaders defined the nation to the people of India and to the world. We were sovereign, secular, and democratic. Here was a country that was primarily feudal, caste-driven, multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-religious, that was born out of incredible communal slaughter and the largest mass migration of people in history, and yet had the courage to look into the future with a sense of purpose, and most importantly, a sense of poetry. And back in this dream was a large section of the educated and professional middle and upper middle class. They were the ones who mobilized the masses in the struggle against imperial rule. That's how our country was born, multi-religious, pluralistic, and inclusive. Left behind the shadow of forces, also from the middle class, though much smaller in number, yet potent in influence, that were vehemently opposed to this idea. They had a different agenda and a far simpler notion of what our country was all about. Hindu India had a glorious past before the coming of invaders and the country could create a glorious future by reaffirming its Hindu identity. These were the two main opposing ideologies and I as a young man was witness to the slow dismantling of one of them and the growth of the other. The journey of this mansion began with the role of the Congress Party from the late 1950s to the late 1970s. What amazed me was the number of caste and communal riots that occurred in state after state under its watch in Gujarat, Maharashtra, UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. If one checks the records, they were in the hundreds. Very rarely did these events make front page news. More often than not, they seem casual, yet gruesome reminders tucked away in the back pages. I could only guess at the reason forces behind these atrocities, and yet I did realize something very clearly. The idea of India that was defined in the Constitution was being relentlessly confronted by another reality on the ground. If nothing was done to check, to address these issues, the consequences for the future could be disastrous. The second part was the Congress's overindulgence of the Muslim clergy. I understand that good governance means recognizing the needs, aspirations, and fears of minorities. But when did clerics become the sole spokespeople of these fears and aspirations? Though the decades after independence, the condition of the minorities, especially, especially in the north, west, and east of India, sharply deteriorated, and today it is abysmal, this money party of the Muslim clergy gave right wing fundamentalists enough ammunition to screen minority appeasement and vote bank politics. These charges found immense resonance with large sections of the middle class in the 1980s and would also have enormous consequences in the future. There was one movement, however, that really set me thinking. 
and that is the city of Mumbai. It is the beginning of a political formation that started up in the city of Mumbai. It was the birth of the Shiv Sena. Backed by the Masrit Bar sympathetic street gangs, it would begin to attack South Indians, move on to threaten and squeeze Gujarati businesses, then pick up the sound of the, sound of the soil slogan and attack North Indians, and then by the early 1990s, the family settled down on a Hindu platform through a series of riots. Mumbai, the nation's most cosmopolitan city and its financial and entertainment and industrial and entertainment capital, had now come under the influence of this party, which had turned the city's streets into a battleground. And by and large, in this violent journey of theirs, the political parties in power and the law enforcing agencies looked the other way. What really set me thinking was that the Sena had the support of a large section of an affirmative, angry and educated Marathi-speaking middle class that were left out and marginalized in the growing employment opportunities of this burgeoning city. The Sena was their deliverer for real or imagined injustices. What would follow from the 1980 onwards would be an onslaught. We had the Naxalite movement in Bihar, Jharkhand, Andhra, etc. We had insurrection in Manipur, Nagaland, Mizoram, a large scale violent agitation in, of farmers in, in Western UP and Rajasthan. Farmers in Maharashtra also joined the agitation. The state of Assam was in turmoil with the movement that collided with the rail against outsiders and it manifested this anger among the most savage acts of brutality in which more than 1,500 old men, women and children were bludgeoned to death outside a village called Delhi. In Punjab, a violent militant movement began that demanded a separate state for six. The agitation and militancy was brought under control with the army storming the Golden Temple where hundreds of people died. The final act of this militancy unfortunately ended with the murder of a prime minister and then the slaughter of more than 3,000 innocent Sikhs in a gruesome act of revenge in Delhi and other parts of the country. This all happened in the 1980s. Thanks to a botched and rigged election, militancy in Kashmir, headed by Pakistan, launched a protracted armed revolt. As the slogans of the militants got shrilla and more communal, mass migration of Hindus from Kashmir from the Kashmir Valley occurred. In the north, after the Mandal Commission report, backward caste began organizing themselves in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Rajasthan. There was a violent backlash from the upper castes. All this in the 1980s, but simultaneously, almost like milestones, there were horrific communal riots. Simultaneously. Muradabad, Malyana, Bhagalpur, Bhuvandi, Ahmedabad. These are the, the big ones, I'm not even talking about the smaller ones. And all this is happening in our country at that time of the 80s to the early 90s. What did all these movements reveal? That a political and economic structure was not delivering and the tenor and tone of political discourse was turning more brutal and more violent. We are all aware of what the Jansan in its new avatar as the Bharatiya Janata Party did next. What is, however, important to note is that the Grand Dhamna Bhumi struck a chord specifically with the last se with large sections of the middle and upper middle classes in North and Western India because the idea was perceived as the launching path for a proud and resurgent India. The movement culminated in the horrendous criminal riots in Mumbai, where more than 15,000 people died, 5,500 uh, died, bomb blasts were killed. Hundreds of more innocent people in a strange and macabre way, these two events faithfully served the purpose. They shocked the nation and polarized it. As for the BJP, it went on from a party of almost nothing to a party of plenty, and also from a party on the fringes of, of politics to center stage. The writing was on the wall. Does all this history link? to political choices. I believe it does. Because the way people think determines their attitude to their families, their communities, their cities, their country and then the world. And the elections of 2014 came at a time 
when the so-called economic miracle had turned into a nightmare. As corruption reached every nook and corner of our existence, as the stock market distant stepped from ground realities and created wealth only for manipulators, as the IT industry reached its saturation point and small and medium manufacturing industry began to collapse, as horrific acts of violence against women became everyday events and item songs and films proliferated, as bomb blasts ripped through cities, buses, trains, and markets of taking many innocent lives, and quite a few innocent were also arrested for them, as engineers and engineering students found it more difficult to find jobs, as agriculture could not sustain itself and begin to the land and head it towards urban centers, as other terror attacks occurred in Parliament and Mumbai, where hundreds of people died, as thousands of dead farmers committed suicide while film stars up their peas and crows, as steam operations revealed economic scams everywhere, as service industries shrank, as the Minas opposed the good judgment in Rajasthan and the Kanadikas opposed the Tamil in Karnataka, as crony capitalists and their lobbyists stroked the priorities of power in state capital and in Delhi, as higher education was no longer a pathway to economic salvation, as judges were found to be corrupt, as politicians and bureaucrats amassed enormous wealth, as healthcare costs soared. And where the to reach absurd levels, the strange desperation set in. It was in these desperate times that the middle and upper middle classes, specifically in North and Western India, chose Mr. Modi as the Messiah that the country needed to deliver to police from these calamities. Though the recent election and the results that followed seemed to be a debate between good governance and bad, we need to ask a question. Was it really? I believe there was a subtext to the entire campaign that is far more important. I say this because of the choice of the Bharati Janta Party made of its Prime Minister candidate before the election campaign. The choice that the party made. Here was a man vilified within the country and around the world for presiding over the mass slaughter of innocence within the state of Gujarat. <coughs> he was a man attacked by many as a fascist and, and a demagogue. He was known as a man who was uncomp uncompromising on the RSS's ideology and firmly grounded in its perception of history. He was even attacked as a leader who favored rich industrialists in his state at the cost of the poor, the farmers, and the marginalized. And yet in all of this, it didn't matter as he was elected the party's candidate. Did the party know something that those opposing him did not? I believe so. It didn't matter to the party's hardcore base, support base, which had expanded considerably since the demolition of the Babri Masjid. They had waited too long for this day to arrive. I think the party also knew that to the majority of big industrialists, it didn't matter too. It didn't matter to the vast majority of traders because they were the party's traditional vote bank. There was also another group of small but influential supporters to whom it didn't matter. It was a group that I would call the forgive and forget kind. They felt that Modi was needed in this hour of crisis. He was seen as a silver bullet to solve all the problems the that the country was facing. And most importantly, it didn't matter to the very large section of the middle and upper middle class because they had either been sufficiently polarized over the years or been sucked into the world of consumerism and self-preservation. As for the majority of the youth from the middle and upper middle classes, it also didn't matter because to them history did not matter. And besides, they were the sons and daughters of the very same class of people I mentioned earlier. To all of these people, it just didn't matter. The journey is over now, and we have elected Mr. Modi. Whether this is right or wrong for me, right now is immaterial. The journey also tells us <coughs> what most of the middle and upper middle classes have become. And the wider question to ask is, where will they go from here? Thank you.